Today we're talking uh, with Mark Shepard and Dr. Mark Shepard and Dr. Carol Courtney about the uh, pain education manual. Before we get there, though, what I want to do is give us a, a little bit of idea what this pain cast is. Um, it's really an attempt in this, you know, COVID, COVID world to bring a little bit more connection between the, the leadership and the ideas and pain and rehabilitation and physical therapists. And, you know, the topics will shift. We aim to have this as a semi-regular event that's very discussion-based and interactive um, and topics may shift. Today, we're focusing primarily on the, the, the educator's lens and teaching pain education uh, with the pain manual, but that might shift in the future. Um, a few bits of housekeeping before we get going. Um, if, you're, if you're attending um, and, you're not, and um, you're not asking a question, please keep your uh, microphone on mute. Um, and you can certainly enter questions in the uh, chat and um, raise your hand and we can try to get to you. We wanna keep this as discussion-based as possible. So feel free and please speak up if you have a question. Um, you know that some of you may have varying degrees of familiarity with the pain manual and interest in it. And we'd love to have all those questions and I know our, our two guests would too as well. Um, so, and this record this this will be recorded and hosted on our the Pain Sig Facebook group page, which is a new uh, um, Facebook group page, and that you can get information as well as the Pain Sig AOPT Pain Sig website. Um, and before we get to the the uh, actual kind of conversation about the Pain Manual, I want to do a couple announcements kind of related to CSM. Uh, we're going to have a pain sig me me membership meeting that's to be determined that'll be online this year. Uh, so pay attention to that um, when that comes out. Uh, we have a, the pre-con event, which uh, is directly related to this discussion today, it's, uh, which we're sponsoring. It's titled Modern Pain Curriculum for DPT Students, Application of the Pain Education Model for DPT Educators. That's on Tuesday, February 1st from 7 to 4 p.m. at the Marriott River Center. Salon F. And then we're also sponsoring a CSM session, Understanding Fear Avoidance in, in Patients with Acute and Subacute Chronic Pain. This is a, a feature speakers from an upcoming a special issue of PTJ or PT Journal um, related to fear of movement and physical therapy. And this is Friday, uh, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. in the convention center, and it'll be in the Lilla Cockrell Theater. Um, there's also an on-demand portion for this. The on-demand portion will be available March 1st um, through the 31st. Um, you can find that as well. Uh, additionally, there's a ton of great CSM pain programming. We're going to come out with a, a bullet list for that. So look for that also on the Facebook group page as well. And if you're interested in, in CSM sessions related to pain, please get in contact with me. Um, session proposals are due uh, coming up here already on March 14th, and I'd love to hear them and help help shape those for the next CSM in San Diego. Um, all right, so let's kick this off. Let's get to our guests here. So um, we're joined by Drs. Mark Shepard and Carol Courtney. Um, why don't you go and introduce yourselves, and then uh, we'll start talking about this pain manual. Sure thing. Thanks, uh, Eric, for the intro, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, join Joining us, excited to see a, a great group of people, lots of familiar names here. So it's good to see uh, a lot of you digitally um, uh, at this point in time. Uh, my name is Mark Shepard. Shepard. I am a uh, physical therapist that has been involved with the pain SIG for a number of years. I actually had Eric's position um, for three years and uh, just loved the uh, environment that the SIG provided within AOPT. And uh, Part of that uh, position really got me passionate about, um, you know, pain education in DPT programming. Um, uh, my day-to-day -day job is actually in post-professional education. I'm the program director for a orthopedic manual physical therapy program, um, but uh, at Bellin College in Green Bay, Wisconsin. But um, uh, this project here, uh, just blessed to work with just a great group of people. So excited to talk about it. And Carol, I'll, I'll let you uh, do your intro as well. Thanks, Mark. And uh, thanks, Eric, for inviting us to, to talk about the pain education manual. Uh, my name is Carol Courtney. Hi, everybody. Uh, really happy to be here. I'm a professor at Northwestern University. 
Uh, I'm uh, a pain researcher. I look at mechanisms of pain, especially related to physical therapy interventions and in related to osteoarthritis. And um, I was really excited to be invited to be a part of this group on the pain education manual because um, you know it's something I'm very passionate about. Um, I have uh, I have experience teaching at the DPT level, but also at post professional level. And I I really believe that uh, that this is like this uh, this talk will be more on what we're doing for DPT education, but that obviously kind of flows over into post professional education. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Right, thanks, Mark and Carol. All right, so let's kind of we the, our view our our viewers might have a varying idea of what this pain manual is. So I'd like to start off with just kind of some general questions. Like, what is the pain manual, and 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 why was it developed? And Mark, I'll have you start with this. Yeah. So the the pain manual kind of birthed from uh, something that the academy, then the orthopedic section, did. Uh, in the early 2000s. And for those of you who may be familiar with the manipulation education manual, which was really uh, kind of spearheaded around the 2003, 2004 timeframe, um, that's kind of where this idea stemmed from. Because back when they, uh, when the academies or the section supported that at the time, they wrote a manual that basically said, this is the way that thrust manipulation in particular should be um, you know, delivered in entry-level DPT education. And it was almost like a white paper that just laid it out on the line and, and this is what we're going to do. And in the years after that, there was some research going, you know, how is it being implemented? Is it helping at all? And it really had a nice trajectory of what needs to happen between, you know, the, the time point when that came out and then moving forward. And so when Joe Donnelly became president of uh, AOPT, um, you know, the, the House of Delegates had the motion that was accepted and, and supported um, basically taking the IASP curricular guidelines related to pain, international guidelines, and saying, okay, we're going to run with this in the United States to use this as our guidelines for entry-level DPT education. And so Joe basically said, hey, we should really kind of put our heads together and, and bring this forward um, to, to apply the international guidelines to the United States from what we as experts in pain and pain and treating pain and teaching about pain, what we need to do um, at the entry level, uh, lev uh, you know, education level. And so, you know, we got our team together um, and, uh, you know, obviously Carol's part of this, but we had a, a group of individuals, uh, Dr. Craig Wassinger, uh, Dr. Scott Davis and uh, Bill Rubine um, all came together to, to form this group. And we worked with uh, APTA as well as IASP um, to, to kind of get our bearings straight at first. And then we just ran with it. And we used, literally used the manipulation education manual as a template of sorts to, to drive ourselves forward. But the key piece um, for those of you who haven't seen it, you can get the manual. It's a free resource through the AOPT website. If you go to the pain SIG, you'll see it right there. Um, is really to try to be as uh, explicit uh, with examples of how to podcast. actually I'm apply this. And that was, that was something that I think we really wanted to make sure that educators understood that this wasn't just this theoretical thing. It was like, here are actual examples of learning objectives. Here are actual activities that folks are doing uh, to, to bring this to life. So that's kind of our goal. That's where it came from. And that's how we, we got to where the product is today. Did you hear from educators and perceive a, 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 a need that there wasn't really anything to really guide educator, educators? It, a little bit of both. Um, I think the, the main thing that we realized, I think, as we were looking at the international guidelines is that there is this process where we have the international guidelines set forth, but they're international, right? So they're very um, broad based because they have to be able to apply to different settings, different countries, different practice, um, you know, abilities, scope of practice. 
And so as, as a lot of researchers have started doing, they, they created the pain core competencies. Uh, Marie Bennett and Kathleen Sluka have really uh, applied that to, to entry level in, in a publication they did in PTJ several years ago. Um, and so what we were really trying to do is say, okay, this is how we interpret the international guidelines to fit the United States. And, and that's what we felt like may have been missing is that there wasn't the, the, the micro level view of what does the international macro level mean for us. I don't know, Carol, if you, if you have different thoughts there, but that's kind of where my perspective came. Well, I'll just add that you're absolutely right. And it's a pain, it's a manual. And so it's like, it's really more of guidelines of when I go back to my own, uh, you know, faculty, uh, you know, and look at the curriculum, how am I actually going to uh, put this into the curriculum? And so I, I agree, we tried to really bring it home to the faculty member of, of what, what needs to be done or what changes can I bring to the curriculum committee? Yeah, that's one of the things when I looked at the document that I really enjoyed about it is that it, you know, reading the ISP guidelines or you know, some of the other documents, you guys got into the weeds, into the concrete stuff that educators have to do, create objectives, think about assessments, and, and, and even just syllabi outlining an entire course. And I think that is one of the things when I looked at that, this, I really liked because I could compare my own curriculum to this and say, okay, am I, am I covering these objectives or, you know, or if I'm looking for ideas, because there's, this is a challenging area to teach, I think. I think everyone that's, it's a little bit less straightforward than some of our other areas in physical therapy. And so sometimes the assessment can be a little bit challenging to think about. So I really appreciate that about the document. Um, when I, when I, when one of the other things I really liked about it as well is that you, I think what you were articulating, like the ISP has like four major competencies or domains, and you really expanded that to, eight or nine, I believe. And I think that speaks to trying to kind of tailor that to the individual aspects of United States practice. Yeah, definitely. And um, I remember, <clears throat> uh, Carol, you and I in particular having this conversation, it was kind of like this aha moment when we were thinking through how are we going to organize this? Because like you said, Eric, there's, you know, when you look at the international guidelines, uh, there, there's four kind of umbrellas where, where this content lives. Um, and, and when you start to whittle it down, you're like, wow, that's a lot of kind of mental energy to focus on each of these areas. So Carol, I don't know, did, what, what brought you to, to kind of come to this, uh, what we called clinical or pain dimensions uh, within, within the curriculum? Well, uh, I can just recall that it, it was even more than that at one point. And then the more we looked at them, we said, no, no, these should come together. And we finally came to the number that we came to. And um, I, I think it was the whole group. Everyone kind of thought about their own curriculum and then you know, how it made more sense to all of us and, and what we thought would be really palatable to faculty members as they were trying to apply it. You know? what, what other challenges did you guys come across in creating this document? Well, I can speak to one, Mark. Um, I think in the early days, um, one challenge is that our pain SIG is actually uh, a part of the orthopedic academy. And so it, there was this thought that other academies might think, well, this is just ortho academy. This is, does this pertain to us? So we had many conversations uh, with, with different uh, leaders in different academies to really emphasize that even though we're uh, a part of the pain SIG and under this academy, that we were really trying to be broad-based in what we were developing for this pain manual. And when after we developed the manual, we also vetted it with leaders from all the different uh, academies. Mark, maybe you want to add to that. Yeah, that, that was one that definitely came to mind. Um, you know, the, the other piece is probably what many people are thinking about when you look at the manual. It's like, how am I going to fit all this content into my curriculum? And when you look at it, probably more specifically, you'll see that a lot of it is probably covered. 
it's just not as intentionally linked together or scaffolded as much as maybe you, you've done in the past. And so I think one of the challenges, especially when we had people vet and review our manual, uh, is saying like, I don't know if we can fit all this stuff in. And, and we all hear about curricular creep and, you know, it seems as though there's always a new CAPD element kind of popping into standard seven or standard six, where you're like, oh, how am I going to, you know, address this now? Um, and so we, we tried to really be mindful of saying, you know, what, what is really important for the entry level provider? And if you think about it, you know, there's nearly a third of the U.S. population is suffering from persistent pain. Um, everybody experiences pain. You know, if we don't have enough of the information to provide the resources for faculty to teach modern pain, science, treatment, assessment, we're missing the boat and we're not serving our patient care. And I would argue that because, um, you know, the way that our response and treatment of pain is to, to this day, I mean, obviously the opioid crisis is still around. We're still dealing with people who are suffering from persistent pain we're not doing enough, we're not doing it well enough. And I think it's just so complex. It's, you know, pain is not just a system. And this goes right back to what Carol said, you know, where this is something that affects every physical therapist, whether you're in acute care, pediatric care, neurologic, pain is pain and people feel that and experience that. So, you know, trying to bring in the breadth of what that means, as well as try to make it practical for someone to put into their program without feeling like it's curric curricular creep was a challenge. And I think it still is. And, and one that at our pre-con course we're doing, we're going to try to sift through that and say, how do we take this manual and actually use it in our program? Eric, I'll just add to that. Um, I think, and I think everyone uh, that's on this call would, uh, would agree that the science, uh, in our understanding of the mechanisms of pain have just exploded, and particularly in the last 20 years. And, I, and really, I could go back to 1980. It's, we know so much more than, than we did at that time. And you know, pain, like, like Mark says, it's like the elephant in the room. I mean, it's really what we uh, treat or manage a lot in our practice. And so we're just bringing to the forefront what is being taught, but it's probably, you know, it's probably been implicit. I think we're trying to make this more explicit of, of what should be taught. So I'll, I'll, I'll be more specific. I think, you know, in the first year, your, your, your students are getting a lot of basic science, basic neuroscience, neurophysiology, anatomy. What we're saying is, hey, just make sure whoever's teaching that that they're addressing these points that the, and this could be really subtle changes that they make in their, in their outlines in their course syllabi. And so just to bring it forward. And so again, I'm hoping that it won't be so much of a curricular creep, but that they can just say, Hey, make sure you're hitting this. This is important because we're going to take that thread when they get to the second year and take it further. I don't know if you, you both have experienced this as educators, but over the years since I've only been teaching in PT higher ed for about three years now, but are students more tuned into this now coming into the DPT programs? I find that there's there's some students that are that really gravitate towards this and automatically, and I, I find that pretty hopeful. Carol, you wanna go start? I'll let you start. <laughs> um, yes, but I, and that relates to probably uh, many things. Um, we have a, a more sophisticated student that, are, that shows up at our doors these days. Secondly, the opioid crisis, uh, you know, they're, they're introduced to that. I think DPT education as a whole has changed. And so that, yes, I think that um, they're, they're much more uh, in tune with that. And I think the lived experience of our students is something that <clears throat> is, is a very uh, touching point to a lot of them. Uh, I've experienced many students who've had uh, friends, family members, or even themselves where they have dealt with persistent pain. And it's uh, amazing to be uh, you know, teaching about this in, in a DPT program where some, you know, you get that student who sticks after and comes up and says, this is just outrageous to me to, to think about 
uh, how complex pain really is. You know, I, my mom had this thing, or, you know, I had an uncle who passed away because of, um, you know, taking opioids. Um, you know, it, it's just that pain, when you look at it in our society today, it, it, it's like one or two degrees removed from you, whether you're teaching it or whether you're learning about it. Um, and I think that's what makes it more front and center for folks because they just, they have lived experiences. And I think that's what's so awesome as well, because it's already primed them to maybe want to pay attention and learn more about it because so much of what our students come in with, as far as their understanding about pain is, is so much aligned with what society thinks pain is, you know, and it's not always accurate and usually can be very scary. Um, and so there's almost, almost something comforting, I think, that um, our students really love to hear about, but it's also empowering. And I think that that is something that they can take immediately back to a friend or family member or even themselves to say, hey, I, I, I can actually beat this. This is something that I can change. Um, and that's that's the hope we try to provide to our, our patients. And, and I try to provide as well. I know Carol does it all the time to, to our students. There's a, there's a bunch of points I wanted to follow up with there. I had follow-up questions, but I, I want to take this moment to just, again, if you've just joined the call um, or joined the PainCast, uh, if you have questions for our guests, feel free to enter those in the chat or raise your hand. Um, this is meant to be interactive with you all as well. And so if you're a clinician or educator um, interested in, in the pain manual and what it can bring to you, um, yeah, feel free and, and put those in there. Um, um, don't be shy. Um, so kind of returning to this idea of the breadth. I mean, you look at the, the, I'm just looking at the pain education manual right now. It's 119 pages. And uh, I mean, that could in itself be, you know, a textbook. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, are you intending that everyone or that an educator incorporates all of this? Or um, how, do, how, how might I, and I know this might get to what you're, what you're going to be going on at pre-con, but um, perhaps provide, maybe Carol or Mark, you can provide some insights into how to kind of sift through this and apply it to your own curriculum as an educator. Yeah, I think where I would start first, um, you know, to get the meat, you go to the didactic tables, the pain uh, didactic tables, and there's a clinical table too, as well. Um, and you can look through all the dimensions and we've really lined up, you know, what are examples of learning objectives? What are examples of learning activities? Um, you know, what are resources that you can use to better educate yourself about this particular pain dimension? What are lectures that you may use? So I think that's kind of the first place I would start. I always like as a clinician, you know, kind of having like that quick, um, you know, something you can pull up on your computer really quick that's easy to kind of look through. And that's kind of how I saw these tables coming together with our team is saying we need something that is easy to, to digest instead of just being in word form. There is a lot of narrative as part of our manual, but we did that because we wanted to show the intent behind what we feel is really important. And Gail Jensen has come out and she has been very clear in her articles in PTJ on excellence in DPT education. And so we really wanted to align our pain man, uh, manual with, with what we feel is, uh, you know, towards that master adaptive learner. And we feel that that's kind of what builds up over in the narrative aspect. But those tables to me are where I would like go to first and just see what, what's there and what can I easily implement uh, at this point in time. That, that's great, Mark. I'll, I'll just add uh, my perspective. I, I think that when, when I think about pain education, um, I think, you know, first year, second year, third year of DPT education. And during that, you know, that, that first year, I think understand mechanisms, neurophysiological mechanisms of pain can be a real starting point. And then when we get to second and third year, we think about how our interventions can affect these pain mechanisms. So that's one of the real big pushes of the IASP, also the Cimenti and Sluka paper, is that we should be taking a mechanisms approach to treating uh, pain. And, and that's really a novel thought. I think 
I think medicine's probably been a little ahead of us, but but to be honest, a little, a, the way they treat mechanisms is often through medications. But the thought that our interventions can alter uh, pain mechanism. And I mean, I say this because, you know, it wasn't that long ago, we, we kind of thought the pain pathways were hardwired. You know, neuroplasticity is a really fairly modern concept. So the fact that our interventions can affect these mechanisms is really a, a new thought. So I think that's a good way to approach the educational model. Like here's, here's the, the anatomy and the physiology of how it works. Here's what happens with neuroplasticity, you know, with nociplasticity, if you will. And then here's how our interventions might affect those. So. Yeah, um, going, thinking more about just the student and one of the things, you know, that is harder to put into a document is, is the psychometric or, or psychometric, um, psychomotor, uh, uh, assessments and, and drills and activities. And I think that's always especially challenging with, with pain because you may be doing something in the context of working with a patient with chronic persistent pain, and it looks very similar to what is being done with an acute, you know, an acute case, but the rationale might be different and the progression might be different. And, you know, so I'm wondering if you can Carol, give us some insight into kind of some of the discussions related to that that you guys had as you were putting this together. Oh, well, well, I'll just say that, um, you know, each of us kind of uh, tackled a different piece. And so it was really nice for me to see how, like the different uh, dimensions and components people write like, oh, that's good. I'm going to add that to my curriculum. Um, but I think what you're asking is uh, just to clarify, like how we might, uh, what are some parts that we might put into a curriculum, this psychomotor piece? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I think, you know, I'll just give you a little bit of context. I think our, and this is comparing my, where I'm at now in my career to my DPT education, which was right at the start of the DPT to now, we, there's a heavy emphasis on the psychomotor performance aspects of physical therapy now, and especially with, I, th I think within our curriculum as I compare it to what it was before. And I think I've been, in the, and there's the person who teaches the pain content in our curriculum, I've been challenged by this because it's, it's harder to, maybe these patients are more complex, so there's more uh, variability in what a, you can't just grade the student as right or wrong because that answer might be right, depending on how a student interprets the, the, the case. And there's just more variables that you can't just isolate and control as well if you're trying to do like a rigorous psychomotor. So, and maybe that didn't come up in any of your discussions, but it's something I think about as an educator and trying to, you know, as Mark said, achieve that sort of PT excellence um, and get our, our students ready to handle as much as they can from day one on their clinical rotations. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you an example that, that, that often comes up uh, in that, uh, for example, we often try to uh, discuss what are, clinical, what are some features of a clinical presentation that might be indicators of nociplasticity. And so some of our very typical psychomotor skills, such as palpation, um, at, you know, our sensory exam, they, that might get information that will, that should trigger that, the thought that there might be nociplastic mechanisms at play. And so I think that that is psychomotor, but it also, it forces a student to integrate, like, what does this mean? What, what is this spreading pain this patient is getting? Is that uh, radicular pain, or is that due to a secondary hyperalgesia, it, uh, you know, a spreading, that, that spreading pain that can occur with chronic pain. So, so that's what kind of comes to mind as you talk about that, because I think that that sort of integration of the, of, you know, the, of the neuroscience into clinical practices is really key. Mark, do you have any other thoughts on that? I think the only thing I'd 
probably add uh, to this is, you know, when, when you come to maybe assessing psychomotor performance, um, let's say in a, a high stakes or summative types of, a type of assessment, um, you know, I think what, what I've seen and what I've experienced as a, as a DPT faculty member is really looking at practical scenarios that you can apply, you know, some of these uh, components that, that move beyond just, I'm doing a procedure to a person to look more at, okay, you're doing that because of why. So we're talking clinical reasoning, essentially. Um, and so some of the discussions we, we had in particular to this was, you know, how do we look at scaffolding the learning experience so that we're assessing the student where they are? And it goes back to Carol's point about, I think about it as first, second, third, um, or beginning to end student journey. And I think when, when you look at the psychomotor aspect, you know, you, you can look at skills and a lot of the skills I think are what, what you may consider more like low tech type things, palpation, um, you know, taking a really good interview is, is kind of like these basic skills that I think are oftentimes, um, you know, just kind of pushed to the side. The neurologic exam and making sure it's just not doing myotones, dermatones and reflexes. Are you, are you actually truly testing, you know, pathways that are involved in that, that change when someone is dealing with, with pain, whether it's acute or, or persistent? So um, a lot of those things I think you can look at scaffolding in and then assessing them, you know, as they progress along in more practical scenarios and, um, you know, with the program I'm associated with, we, we kind of have the pain course, an isolated pain course that is earlier on in, the, in the, the journey of the student, but we have another course that's called complex patient. And some of the patients that we have in that course um, have persistent pain, but also they have you know, uh, they may have diabetes or they have some type of um, socioeconomic stressor or financial thing going on. So we try to make it realistic at that point, And that's further along in, in the curriculum. So, you know, it, it's, it's kind of understanding, I think, where they are in the journey and how you, how you cater your assessments to where that student's understanding is and what the goal is. Um, but it's, it's all about the reasoning, I think, at the end of the day. But you can't just start asking about reasoning in the first couple courses that the student is in because they're just trying to figure out what what what's going on right so that's kind of my thought there yeah um I'm kind of kind of related to that um you brought up and I'd like to hear from you both Carol and Mark the the diversity of ways that this can get taught and you guys kind of bring this up in the manual is you can have the 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 isolated course or the condensed course, or you can have the distributed thread or some combination of the both. And I'm just wondering how you guys, when you're creating them, interested in what your own programs bring and, and, and that, but also the diversity of conversations around this that came up when you were creating the pain manual. Well, Carol, why don't you go I'll, ahead? Yeah, I'll, I'll start because I think that's, I'm glad you bring this up, Eric, because there's a lot of discussion, uh, not just among our group, but, uh, you know, I think in, in all of our, in amongst physical therapists of whether a, a standalone course is the best route, or if you try to integrate. And a lot of uh, faculty members, especially those that are really involved in curriculum, they really believe in an integrated sort of course. They think that that you're getting a more uh, a, a better educational model, but then there's also argument that having a standalone course, you're really making sure someone gets the content that you want them to get. So, um, you know, I'm we have ours is integrated, but I can see the benefit of both. So that's one aspect. Mark, you want to add to that? Yeah, and I, that was that was a big question that came up, and you know, uh, Marie Bement had some really nice. Um, thoughts on that because of the research she's done just on her survey uh, data. And, and I think uh, one of the interesting pieces is that there's really not a right way. We really tried to go away from saying it has to be done this way because there's a lot of unique ways to make this, you know, mold to the curriculum you, you may have, whether it be problem-based or competency-based or 
or what have you. But I, I think at the end of the day, it goes back to my point that pain is, is not a, a siloed experience. It is something that involves every system of the human body, um, as well as lifestyle behaviors, as well as emotions, um, you know, all the contextual factors that come along with that. So to me, having it integrated into the curriculum is really important. And I think a lot of people make it more than it has to be. And I just would like to echo what Carol said. It can be as simple as just saying, hey, this anatomical structure right here, this nerve can send nociceptive symptoms or uh, uh, signals to the brain. And, and even just getting away from using the word pain, you know, this is a pain pathway, you know, that it's, it's kind of just changing language can be really important. Um, and then just cluing in that this is part of, of, of the pain experience. Um, and so I think integrating it in is, is probably one of the more important things, but doing that, you have to be intentional and you can't just go to, you know, Carol's teaching physiology. You can't just be like, Hey, can you throw these things in there? It has to be collaborative and you have to almost map it out uh, to say, okay, here's what these eight pain dimensions are. Where am I in the curriculum addressing all of these things and, and making sure that it, for one, is there, but two, does it build on that? Does it scaffold? And does it truly set the, the student up to see pain interwebbed in with all the other stuff that real people, humans present with when they come into clinic? Because it it ain't just, I have persistent pain. It's just, it's never that, right? It's always something else that is going on. And it doesn't have to be body system related as far as like being diabetic or, or having a traumatic brain injury. It could also be, you know, just all the other stuff, stress, um, you know, just anxieties, fears, all those things play into it. So to me, it's, it's really important to integrate, you know, having a siloed course with integration, I think is, is good, but making sure you're intentional, mapping it out is really important, I think. Great, well, I wanna take a, another moment here and, and, and open this up. If you have any questions uh, for our two guests about the pain manual or, or feedback, um, feel free and unmute yourself, put, put that in the chat. Um, Cause I'm sure we'd all like to hear from you and, and, and your thoughts about uh, pain education and, and DPT curriculum. <laughs> I see Soren's uh, question you. <laughs> what do you think, Carol? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I was going to direct that back to you. I, I'm not sure. I'm, now I'm, I'm reading through the rest of his. his... Yeah, so. Soren, uh, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just paraphrase here and puts in the chat. When will the pain, cur uh, pain curriculum be addressed on the board exams? And then also goes on to say that they offer a hybrid standalone course in threading pain science curriculum. And then however, my department has been supportive of the amount of time I cover, the material is limited given the focus on covering board exam areas. And not all the colleagues view this as um, essential entry level information. So that's, sure. a, I think those are a bunch of great points and I'd love to hear from you both on this. Yeah. It that that's Soren. Thank you so much for that question. That that was definitely something that, at the outskirt of our committee coming together, um, you know, talking with Scott Davis, um, he just had such great insight on this from just a high level. You know, like what can this do? What should we be thinking about? And and a lot of what we wanted to come from this manual is a stepping stone to say. Here is where we drew the line in the sand. This is what we feel is important in our DPT curricula. Now we need to start making changes in CAPTI. I think the only way we can get to the board exam is through CAPTI. Now, if you look at CAPTI, and we're probably all familiar with this as educators to see where pain lives within CAPTI, it is not a lot. I mean, it, pain is literally mentioned like one time in standard 7 D, uh, D19, which is only looking at assessment, evaluation, exam. Um, and for something as complex as pain, why aren't we looking at at least mentioning certain aspects about the assessment related to pain in some of the other areas? Do we need a pain element 
and that's a, a standalone. I don't know if that's necessarily the right way to do it, but I think there needs to be more specifics called out so that programs can say, oh, we, we need to do this. We need to um, look at this type of thing and, and be more mindful of it. But until we can get CAPTI to change, I don't know if it will actually change the boards. Um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things, unfortunately. Uh, can I just add one thing that, 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 thanks Mark, because you just kind of triggered something for me in that the recent research in the last 20 years has shown that some of our, some of our, in, our typical interventions that we use in physical therapy, and I mean 10, I mean like 10s, uh, exercise, certain types of exercise, manual therapy, we now know that the way they relieve pain is by accentuating or facilitating descending pain uh, inhibition. So that's how the mechanism of how they work. I mean, that is a paradigm shift for us. I think about the manual therapist who felt like it's working almost because they're stretching a joint out or something. Well, yeah, maybe that's true, but we do know now that they work in a new manner, and especially the whole isometric exercise and aerobic exercise. I mean, I think that's gonna be critical that that sort of information, uh, you know, trickle down and even get on the boards because we should be using these interventions purposefully to actually try to accentuate descending inhibition, if, if that's the aberrant mechanism. So teaching not only like ACSM guidelines for reps and sets, but teaching descending facilitation alongside of that. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think picking up with where, where Soren's point, question was, is I think one thing maybe might be of interest to, what is like beyond entry level? What is beyond this? What's the, you know, what, what did you cut out? <laughs> if there's anything that you, that you cut out. Well, I, I'll say something then, Mark, you can kind of address this. Uh, because I, like I said, I teach at DPT level, residency level, and fellowship level, and mostly related to orthopedics. So that's, that's my background. I will say this in that, you know, sometimes we're teaching, we can be teaching on concepts at all three levels. But with each level, there becomes a greater and greater understanding and integration. And so I, I teach a neuro exam at all three levels and, and their ability to integrate and understand a, a good neuro exam, uh, it grows as they grow in their clinical experience and their education. And so that's, that's my two cents. Some of these concepts don't change that much. It's just that your understanding of them and the ability to apply them to a patient grows. Mark, you want to add to that? I, I just want to echo that that's exactly the way I see it. Um, <laughs> I look at it as, as an iceberg, if you will. You know, each, each level of post-professional training will take you deeper into the ocean to see where that iceberg will take you. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, when you, when you talk to folks, they get a little frustrated because they're like, well, what, what am I going to get that's new from, from this or that? And, and I would say it's not necessarily something new. It's just, you're going to, you're going to have a better depth of knowledge and like Carol said, integrating that into patient care. So we didn't, I don't think we really intentionally said, oh, this is only for post-professional. I think we said, these are the tools that, you know, you need to have as an entry level clinician and then going forward. You know, maybe there's a pain manual that will be done for residency fellowship, but to me, it's going to look very similar, just more context, uh, more integration. All right, we got a great question in the chat um, um, from Leanna. She asks, um, do either of you have any advice or thoughts on developing, you know, developing DPD programs that are starting to build from the ground up? Where to start? So I guess this is in some ways maybe like the ideal case because you've Yes. You know, you got a blank slate to build with, and some of us have been constrained by the, the history of our programs to fit pain in where it makes sense. But this is from the ground ground up, where to start in making sure these concepts are mapped appropriately and collaboratively. I think that's a great question, but I have to agree with Eric in some way that it, it would be ideal. I mean, because pain is such a it's it's such a, a big part of our practice. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to start from ground up 
uh, and, and really integrate it throughout your coursework and thread it, I mean, throughout the coursework. Uh, Mark, do you wanna to add to that? I just wanna say, <clears throat> Leanna, thanks for the question. Great seeing you on here as well. Um, you know, I, I am super lucky because as soon as I was working with this team, I, I was working with Bell and College's um, DPT program, which we're building from the ground up. And as we were putting this together, you know, we were in the, the, the main gist of putting the curriculum together. And so I was very intentional uh, talking to the faculty we have on board right now to, to say, Here, here's what I would love to integrate in let's talk about this. Let's be mindful about our learning objectives. Let's see how we can work together and integrate this in. So it was really a privilege because it came at such a, a great time, but um, it's one of those things where you take it and you say, okay, where, where can I do this? And you map it out the best you can and say, okay, here's that's happening in this course. Okay. That's happening here. Let me talk to this faculty member. Let me be really good at when we actually get the curriculum going, we're going to collaborate and maybe I'll come in for a lecture here or do a lab here. It's just, it's got to be collaborative. I think it's a key thing for, for me, from my experience. Yeah. All right, we have another question in the chat here um, from Jen. I live with persistent pain and became a PT due to, my, due to my personal journey. My experience in my doctoral education was quite lacking. How will this assist educators in appropriate application of pain science and clinical application? Well, Jen, you know, thank you for sharing this with us. Uh, you know, as Mark said earlier, uh, you know, persistent pain is a, it's a pervasive problem, uh, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And so um, the only thing I can say is that, uh, and I said this at the beginning of the hour, the research uh, in this area is changing rapidly. And so what I've found is, and I think this is one of the impetus or what the impetus for a developing the pain education manual is there's a lot of, there are many faculty that, that are not up to date on, on what, should, what should be involved in DPT education. So we are really hoping that, th that this can start a revolution, if you will, uh, in US education, because it's, it's, it's super important and you really bring that to the table with your question. Yeah, Jen, thanks again for sharing that. You know, and I think uh, I, I, I look at this as such an uh, advantage for, for you if you're um, you know, interacting with students because you have that lived experience. It, it gives that certain passion that I think students need to see because of, of your experience. But our hope is that the manual will bring to light, as, as Carol said, you know, more of this awareness of what, what is it that we are calling out for faculty to, to implement and influence in our DPT students. But you know, a, a piece of paper, as we all know, or a digital file is not going to change behavior. Um, behavior change takes time and it takes mentorship. Um, and when we look at it at a faculty level, we, we've really said, you know, we, we have to go out and, and take this on the road, so to speak. And Carol has been very uh, you know, adamant that we create what we call pain schools. And so we've come to, to this idea and actually brought it forth to AOPT. Um, to help us develop what we consider a pain school, which is basically uh, um, a course dedicated to faculty on implementing this information. And, and pretty much, um, you know, what we've started to do with this, uh, our CSM pre-conference course is to, one, develop content that basically teaches the background of what each of these eight pain dimensions are. So saying, you know, what is you know, the basic neuroscience of pain, um, how do we assess for pain and, and what, are, what are some of the ways we can treat pain um, that's evidence-based and, and is aligned with our manual. Um, so I think we would be kind of missing the point to say, to think that the manual is going to change, you know, it's like a flip of the switch, um, but I think we need more uh, efforts, which the, the Academy is definitely um, supporting to go out and partner with faculty, partner with programs to say, you know, how can we help you to actually implement this? Because our, our pre-con course is not just sitting and lecturing. It's small group activities. You're literally coming up with activities you would do in your program. And you're working with other educators that are thinking about this for their programs too. So it's really meant to be 
a, a group think collaborative process where you can say, okay, I have some stuff that I can now bring forward to my, my program, but it, it's going to take, you know, change agents out there to really bring this forward and be passionate about it. And, and Jen, because of your lived experience, I can tell you're going to be one of those folks that are truly living this and bringing it forward. Uh, and I'll just add one thing. Um, the pain school actually was, wasn't my idea. In Europe, they have pain schools all the time. And um, there's, and so I just said, hey, why don't we do pain schools like, like we find there? And so, I, you know, it, it just seemed like a no brainer, you know. Yeah, and the, the other thing too, is that there, there are pain schools, so to speak, in the US, but they're very research based. I know, Carol, when we kind of looked into it, that's what we found. It's really dedicated to research efforts, which don't really align well with like, faculty teaching type things. Um, so we, we really wanted to, to get something that was more dedicated to faculty um, on, on the ground level there, as well as potentially clinical instructors, which is uh, another area that I think is really important. So yeah, that's great. Um, I like it. The, the questions are starting to come in and we're, we're pushing up on the hour. So I want to get to at least one of the more of these and then we'll start kind of wrapping things up. Um, has your team investigated barriers to implementation in DPT programs? And, or what, what barriers maybe if, if you didn't necessarily investigate this, I'm sure you all have perspectives that you can bring to the table and the discussions that you had in creating this. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when we had individuals review our, um, our pain manual, some of the feedback we got was it, it's too much. Um, so I think one barrier that you'll see is that, you know, they'll, somebody will say this is too much to integrate in to the curriculum um, is one. And I think just the other barrier is people's understanding of what modern pain science is. And, uh, you know, in the past five years, my understanding of why manual therapy works is completely different uh, over the 10 years. You know, I've been practicing and, and working with patients. I I flip flopped in a lot of places. You know, and and um, to me, having faculty open minded is great when it comes to pain. But getting multiple faculty members to maybe see eye to eye on that can be sometimes challenging. So that's one other uh, barrier that potentially is out there. And and uh, we just sort of talked about this, but one barrier you might say, well, nobody on our faculty has the expertise. And that's where the idea of the pain schools started to come out. Like, hey, we need to start this. And that sort of happened also with the manipulation education manual. They started to do uh, coursework to make sure that you your faculty had that knowledge to teach that, so. Great. Um, there's one more question that I wanna address here. Do you see a specific portion of the manual or paradigm for clinical experiences. So tapping into that clinical education piece, um, the, the other half of the equation, I guess, in DBT education. Um, can you, either of you speak to that and how the pain manual might, might help out our clinical educators? Yeah, you know, the, it's, Wes, thanks. Uh, great seeing you on here as well. Um, it's a great question. Um, you know, I th think we would be kind of missing the boat if we didn't think about the clinical aspect of DPT education. Um, you know, there, there is sometimes the great divide when, when students go out on their clinical affiliations because you're almost hoping and praying that they get, uh, you know, the, the type of information that you are um, teaching in the program. And so um, what we ended up doing is we created uh, a clinical uh, table that was focused for activities, um, experiences, assessments that clinical instructors can utilize in the clinic. So it could, the table itself could even be a resource to send out to clinical instructors to say, hey, you know, this is, this is what we're teaching in our programs. Here's some ideas if you want to, to try to bring this to life. And we tried to make it as, you know, easy to, to send along as possible. It's as simple as having a discussion or, you know, sending a YouTube video talking about pain to uh, your student and talking about it. Um, even if this clinical instructor, it's new to, to that person, it can be very fruitful to say, hey, I, I didn't know this, you know, this is really neat. Let's talk about it and see how we can apply this. 
So, you know, it's really important to get the clinical instructor in there. But I think as, as many of our education leaders are saying, DPT education or DPT programs need to have really good clinical ties, um, you know, where, where we have a partnership out there uh, with, with our clinics. Um, and I think that's a whole other topic, but um, that's kind of what, what I think is important and one place to really take the manual and run with it from the clinical side. All right, well, I want to thank uh, both our guests, maybe, um, and I, Wes, I, I do want to address um, this. I think we, one idea for an, a follow-up pain cast is to do this completely targeted toward the, the clinical educators. And Bill Rubin had a nice piece that was published related to this. And I think we could have a whole discussion about how we build build those relationships and, and, and take that aspect of education to the next level. And, and um, so look for that. Um, and um, I guess as we wrap things up, Mark, can you just give us a, a brief tease? I know you've kind of hinted at it um, already about, about your pre-con um, CSM event. Fingers yeah. crossed, it's still gonna. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, our, our pre-con is, is uh, a uh, you know, obviously I'm biased. We have a great group. Carol is part of the group, Marie Bemen, Corey Zimney, who's on this call as well, and Craig Wassinger um, came together and really put, put some content that matches this uh, pain manual. We have a online component, which is all based on what is pain science, what is the mechanisms behind our testing and, and treatment approach. And then when you come to CSM, that Tuesday, you're going to essentially be able to uh, sit with a number of other educators and it is active learning, uh, lots of kind of small group work where you get the instructors feedback on things where you're coming up with learning objectives, activities, and then coming up with ways to implement in your program. So it's going to be a lot less just sitting around listening to a couple of people talk about what what we think is best and really trying to consult and work with people to bring it forward to their program. So we hope to see some or hopefully all of you at, at that if you're able. And we do have a lab component that will be a part of the day too. I'll yes. just that part. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Great. Well, I am I am going and I, I look forward to seeing y'all. Um and I want to thank Mark and Carol for joining us today. Uh this is the AOPT pain sig uh, pain cast. Um, and if you have ideas or feedback for this pain cast or ideas for future pain cast, please be in touch with me. Um, you can find my email on the website. Um, you can get in touch with me and give me any kind of information, ideas. I'd like, and again, in terms of the pain cast, we'd like to make this a regular thing and really just increase the interaction around pain and, and physical rehabilitation. Um, all right. Well, that's thank you both for joining us. And uh, I look forward to CSM with y'all. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you.